Alright, so in this lecture video, we are going to discuss the kinetic theory of gases. And the point of the kinetic theory of gases is going to be to relate temperature and kinetic energy. We often associate temperature and heat, but temperature is actually a measure of kinetic energy. And this is what I'm going to show you in this section. Alright, so just like with the ideal gas law, we do have some assumptions. The first is that the number of particles in our container is large. And they are far apart. And keep in mind this is relative to the size of the containers. Remember atoms are on like the order of nanometers so they can be relatively far apart inside of a container because they are so small. They need to obey Newton's laws but on a whole move randomly. And we need them to move randomly because we need to be able to apply some statistics to them. They need to interact through short range forces during collisions. and that the gas molecules are identical. So we're not doing mixtures here. It's either all oxygen or all carbon dioxide or all hydrogen. We're not gonna mix separate uh, molecules inside of the same container. We're gonna start with a container and we are going to have one particle move in the x direction, strike a wall, and then move back to its original position. Because of that, we are going to start working with the impulse momentum theorem. So remember, one half of the impulse momentum theorem is the change in momentum. So we're going to take our final momentum, so mass of the atom times velocity in the x minus a negative mass of the atom times velocity in the x. Remember, it's going to be negative because originally it was moving in the negative x direction, and then it moved back in the positive x direction. So this is going to equal 2 times mass of the atom, velocity in the x. Remember, the other half of the impulse momentum theorem is force net times time is equal then to the change in momentum. Now, of course, here we're trying to get the temperature, and to get the temperature, we need to go through pressure through the ideal gas law. So we need to take a relationship that pressure equals force divided by area. So we're going to turn this in the pressure times area equals force. So I'm going to sub in here pressure times area all right next I want to get rid of the time and I'm going to get rid of the time by using the fact that velocity equals distance over time so that time is going to equal distance over velocity though we do have to be careful we're defining this here as distance so during the collision the object actually collides or travels two times d Alright, so I'm just going to rearrange a little bit because we can cancel out the twos on both sides. And I can move the x squared, or the velocity in the x, up and make it velocity in the x squared. Next, we have area times another dimension, which is going to turn, out, turn into a volume. So we're starting to see signs of kinetic energy in the ideal gas law up here here, where we have pressure times volume here. And then over here we have mass times velocity squared. So we're starting to see the shape of where we're trying to go. 
Now, we do have to take care of one big issue before we can actually get temperature in there. And that is the fact that first, there's not just one particle in a container. Remember, we were supposed to have a large number of containers or a large number of particles inside of our container. So we need to multiply by the number of particles that are actually in the container. And the other thing we have to take into account is the fact that the gas was supposed to move randomly, which means they're not all just traveling in the x direction. They're gonna be equally traveling in the x, the y, and the z direction because they're moving randomly. So we need, rather than just velocity in the x, we need an average velocity of the gas. All right, so now one problem with the gas moving randomly that we have to take into account is the fact that it's gonna be moving equally positive as negatively. So if we take a traditional average, we're gonna end up with zero because it's gonna be positive plus a negative that equals zero because they're equal to each other. So we're gonna do what's called a root mean square. And the name actually tells you exactly what it is. We're first gonna square all the numbers, which is gonna get rid of all those annoying negative signs that make everything zero. Then we're gonna take the average or the mean. Then we're gonna take the square root again to get back to just velocity. So what this is going to look like is that we're going to take velocity in the x squared 1 for particle 1 plus velocity x2 squared. So we're essentially squaring all the velocities and adding them together for every single particle that's inside of the container. And then we're going to divide by the number of particles. And that's going to give you velocity x, what we call RMS squared. And I'm not taking the square root because... I'm just gonna plug it back in here because this is already squared. So that takes into account the fact that there's more than one particle, so we're getting an average velocity. The other thing we have to take into account is the fact that there's more than one direction. Remember, I said that they're gonna be equally in the x, y, and z. So if we add together velocity in the x squared plus velocity in the y squared plus velocity in the z squared, that should give you the velocity of the entire gas. So we're going to say that velocity in the x direction is going to be one third of the overall velocity of the gas. So putting those two relationships together, we get that pressure times volume is going to equal one-third times n, n being the number of particles, mass of the atom times velocity RMS now squared. And sometimes I use average and RMS interchangeably here, so don't let that confuse you. Okay, so now we have taken into account all the particles in the gas. Now we need to get the kinetic energy in there. And I'm going to do this by doing a little bit of a math trick. I'm gonna multiply by two over two. And I haven't changed anything really because two over two is really one. And I'm gonna separate out that two over two. I'm gonna put one, two, the three. And then I'm gonna bring the two on the bottom, the one half, over here. Now this should look familiar to you. Because remember, kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So we can rewrite this as this here, where the pressure is proportional to the kinetic energy of the gas. Now keep in mind that because this is mass of an atom, this is the kinetic energy of one single atom inside of the gas. If we want the kinetic energy of the gas as a whole, we need to multiply by the number of particles. All right, so if we sub in then the ideal gas law, and we're subbing in the version that has the number of particles and the Boltzmann constant in it, we get that temperature is equal to two over three 
the Boltzmann constant, the Boltzmann constant is in the denominator, times one half mass of the atom times V RMS squared. Or that the temperature is equal to two thirds KB. Uh, so those are all just numbers times the kinetic energy of one atom. So here we can see that temperature is really just a measure of the kinetic energy. There is one more relationship that I can give you to relate temperature and the RMS velocity of the gas. And that is that V RMS is equal to the square root of three times the ideal gas times temperature divided by the molar mass. All right, so a couple of housekeeping things here. Remember, VRMS is an average velocity, so not all the molecules in the gas are moving at that velocity. It's just sort of a peak velocity. So a huge chunk of them are going to be moving at that velocity, and then there's sort of wings outward where you get some that are slower and some that are faster. All right, all the temperatures that we're talking about here have to be in Kelvin because it's a plane temperature, and it came from the ideal gas law. So the, you must convert to Kelvin to use these formulas as well. The other thing I have to mention is the difference between diatomic and monatomic. Diatomic means that there are two atoms always put together, and monatomic means that there's only one. So oxygen is naturally diatomic, so there's you'll always find oxygen in pairs. So there'll always be two oxygen atoms hooked together to form a molecule. Now I always will tell you it is diatomic in a problem. I don't expect you to memorize those like you would in a chemistry class, but you do need to know that you need to take two times the molar mass because diatomic oxygen is going to have the mass of two oxygen atoms and also two times the individual mass of the atom. So you, because there's always two atoms hooked together, the molecule is always two times the mass of the individual atom. You don't need to change any other numbers, like number moles stays the same, number particles stays the same. The only thing you have to worry about is the molar mass and the mass of the atom.